Greetings, my name is Vincent, and in this episode, we're going to be painting these Forge World resin power generators created originally for Adeptus Titanicus, but can be used for Legions Imperialis or, of course, Epic 40k. Let's get started here at Bunker 6. <laughs> Here is the Adeptus Titanicus power generator set from Forge World, and because it's from Forge World, it is most likely going to be made of resin. So you're going to want to be using water when sanding or sawing any parts of the resin model. Please be careful, it's not like plastic. I use a very specific primer. It is an Ace Hardware primer that is in this flat concrete style gray. It's my favorite primer for doing big things like terrain. I wouldn't recommend it for small models because it is automotive paint, so you're not going to have as much control over the spread. But if you don't have an Ace Hardware store in your local area, paint brands like Rust-Oleum and Montana have equivalents too. Now to create a bit of variation with the concrete tone, I'm not just going to immediately add a wash over the gray primer. We can do this, but I've noticed in the original box art, there seems to be some brighter tones that are sitting underneath whatever type of shading they did. So we're going to be adding some lighter and darker shades in some random places around the model just to make it look a little bit more natural. I've started with an ivory rather than using a white because I think white can be a little bit too artificial looking sometimes, especially when we're working in something like terrain. Nothing's ever going to be that bright. So an ivory is a nice alternative because it's a little bit yellow. It's not completely brilliant white so it feels a little bit more natural when trying to do these under highlights before you go in with the shading. I'm being very sparing as well with any of these pre-shade highlights that I'm doing because I don't want to cover the concrete too much that's already there because that is the preferable mid-tone that we want to be the majority of the paint job at this point. Once the random patches of ivory were sprayed over all the different models, I moved on to adding the dark colour that I wanted to put into all of the nooks and crannies. Now I am going to be using an oil wash of brown, but I wanted there to be a shade of black or very dark grey that was already airbrushed into all the nooks and crannies, just to give you that impression that there's a lot of soot, not just dirt, accumulating around the models. If you can, use the finest airbrush needle that you can acquire, because you really don't want this paint to go too many places, you want to be very specific with this colour because if you start putting a bunch of black shade in places where it shouldn't be, things are going to start to look unrealistic very quickly. A final concrete tonal variation that I added to the models was this combination of Biltan Green and Nuln Oil washes with a little bit of acrylic thinner, just to see if I could add a little bit of dark green to imply sort of a mossy area on parts of the model, generally lower corners, and maybe some of the nooks and crannies across the model. I used it probably twice on each model. It came out not particularly making too much of a difference, but I think once the wash is added over the top, the eye will unconsciously catch these little green tones peeking through here and there, just to give you that extra little bit of variation. Once all of my mid-tones and my highlights and my shades were added to the initial base coat of the concrete, I moved on to painting the base coat of the silver sections. Obviously any pipe work, and of course we're trying to emulate the original box art, so you always have that as a guide if you're not sure what you should be painting silver. I then moved on to the process of painting in all of the base colours of the brass sections across all of the models. This is a very simple step, just make sure that you keep your paints thin, you don't want things to get chunky too quickly, it's very easily done especially for these kind of metallic paints. If you can, try and find an acrylic specific thinner rather than just using water, and as I always say with metallic paints, make sure you clean your brushes in a pot of water dedicated to metallic paints so you're not contaminating your regular paint pot with metal flakes because you don't want to be putting metal flakes on paint jobs that don't require them. As you can see, we're already about halfway done with this paint job with only a few colors added. Before we proceed with the brown oil wash, we first have to seal the model with some gloss, or in this case, semi-gloss varnish. This just makes sure that the oil doesn't contaminate the paint that's already applied to the model. 
These are the oil-based products that I used, but you do not have to use this particular brand of oil or thinner. You can use pretty much anything you want. You're just going to have different types of results when it comes to finish and drying times. But on the whole, everything should look quite similar. I highly recommend not using your nice brushes for this stage. Any cheap brush will do. Hopefully something that's not going to be affected by the thinners. So just make sure that any type of brush that you use, test it with the thinners first before you start painting things onto the model. I am liberally adding on a mixture of the oil wash and thinners that have been combined in a glass jar prior to application onto the model. It's about a 70-30 mix, 70 being the oils and 30% being the thinners. You don't want to make it too watery. And one mistake I did make in this was probably adding a bit too much oil wash because when it was sitting in some of the crevices, it was going to take a very long time for it to dry because of how much had actually been built up by how liquid the particular solution was that I created. As previously mentioned, the models were left to dry overnight and I also used a hairdryer, but I still, as I previously mentioned, had issues where some of the oils were still pretty much fully wet in some of the crevices and I wasn't particularly sure if they ever were going to get dry and I had to make a video so we had to speed up this process so one of the ways in which I did that was getting a finer brush and just pulling some of the paint out of those crevices with a dry brush just doing that process over and over and over again reducing the volume of paint that was sitting in these crevices hopefully to hasten this drying process in those deeper areas of the model Aside from using fine paintbrushes to pull out excess oil paints, we also have to consider the addition of the entire cleanup process of the model. First things first is making sure you are very cognizant of where you want the oils to not be present. I use a fine paintbrush, Q-tips sometimes, and sponges for specific texture effects. With a sponge, you can pull a sponge down a surface and create artificial streaks through the oil. With a Q-tip, you're generally just pulling off large sections of oil where you know you don't want any of that. And then with a fine paintbrush, you're getting really into the weeds, making sure that you're focusing very specifically on areas that don't require oil and making sure you're creating crisp lines where you want the oil to sit next to a surface that doesn't require it. This process does take quite some time especially for me considering I'm not particularly well practiced in the art of cleaning up oil paints. But it's quite a therapeutic and relaxing process because you're not having to particularly worry about any shading or glazing or anything like that. It's very simple what you're doing here, just take your time. And if you do make a mistake, let's say you do pull off some oils where you wanted them to be left, very easy fix, just grab a paintbrush again, dip it in your oil slash thinners mix, and just reapply it. Now obviously you don't want to wait all night for that to dry, so if it is a small area that you've made the mistake on, you can just pull out the hair dry and give it a good dry for about 10 minutes and it should be workable. Don't forget, you're going to be sealing it with varnish anyway, so hopefully the mistake isn't too big and it's something you can work with. This is one of my favorite steps because you get to see all of your hard work finished in a very interesting way because the matte varnish is what will sell the illusion that this oil wash isn't just an oil wash. Everything that was once shiny will become dead flat and look much more realistic, especially with those oils. The way that the matte varnish flattens off the shininess of the oil is so nice and you'll be able to see that in some instances it can really look quite convincing. This is the finished result of the oil wash with the matte varnish. The lines are quite thick. I could have done them less thick by doing some pin washing, but I wanted things to look a little bit more extreme, especially considering this is terrain. Once everything was dried and sealed and flat, we could then move on to the process of bringing out some of those original colors that have been dampened by the oil wash. We're going to start with doing the metallic silvers, just going to be bringing back some of that 
edgy sheen and some of that shine with painting and with some sponging across the areas that would require it. The sponging is going to be used on the top of that circular arch just to imply that things have dropped on it over the years and things have dinged it so you'd have some of those more shiny parts on top and leaving some of the dark and dingy elements on the lower sections of the silver work. I painted the bunker entrance door in the same combination of dark and light silver 50-50 mix because I didn't want the door to be too dark because I knew I was going to be covering a lot of it in some rusty elements. And if the door was too dark, then those brown elements of rust really wouldn't cut through as well as I wanted them to do. Just to add a little bit more realism to the concrete, I'm just using some pure black paint with some sponge dabbing making sure that there are a few little bits of chipping happening here and there. Just make sure you dab off your sponge before you apply it directly onto the model, because otherwise you can end up in a situation where you make a big black splodge, rather than relying on the texture of the sponge to create the chipping effect. Once all of the metallic sections were finished across all of the power generators, it was time to turn our attention to the concrete highlights. Based purely upon the box art, it looked like a bone colour was used for the highlights rather than a light grey, so I used Screaming Skull in this instance. And when it felt like it was a little bit too artificial and a little bit too bright, I came in with a colour called Graphite by Scale Colour, which matched the primer quite nicely, and I transitioned the Screaming Skull back into this Graphite colour in places just to tone down some of that brightness where necessary. Due to the fact some pre-highlights were already added to the concrete, I didn't feel it necessary to use the Screaming Skull for anything apart from just edge highlighting here and there. The Screaming Skull highlight was used on the chipping effects too. Now we're just going to bring out the copper and brass sections again with this Retributor Gold paint, lovely colour, and it complements the previous copper tones that are already on the model. Now if you want to be even more thorough, you can actually add the base colour of the copper first in some areas prior to adding this gold highlight, but I kind of skipped that step because it didn't feel particularly necessary. And all we're doing here is looking around the model for areas that would require some highlights, not covering every single part of the copper base in this color, just some of the edge highlighting and some other patches here and there. Just be tasteful and mindful that you don't want to lose that copper base underneath. If you add too much gold, things might start to look a little bit too strange because obviously you're not going to be having bright gold elements on a filthy piece of machinery in the 41st millennium or the 31st. I then turned my attention to the shutter door of the bunker entrance. Now, I don't think that's a power generator, and I'm Bunker 6, and that is a bunker entrance if I ever saw one. I wanted it to have a rusty finish, so I couldn't use Agrax Earthshade because it's a much more brown and earthy tone, so I went with a Umber ink instead, which had that more rusty quality to it. The ink has been watered down to help create the capillary action, and if you want to really make a capillary action work on something that doesn't have gloss varnish, it's a good idea sometimes to actually wet the grooves of an area prior to adding any inks or acrylics if you want those inks and acrylic paints to seep into those appropriate areas. I then turned my attention to the lamp at the top of the bunker entrance. Sadly, my particular model here had an air bubble in it and so I didn't have a perfect dome to paint on. I tried my best though to work around this issue. I could have filled it prior to painting it but I didn't notice sadly until it was too late. But you can generally fix these small Forge World air bubble issues that can occur sometimes very easily with some green stuff or some type of epoxy putty. But instead I decided to paint around the issue and I made sure that the black part of the lens or lamp in this instance was where the hole was and the highlights of the blue that were coming up were in the opposite side just to make sure that I didn't have to try and paint in that air bubble and hopefully it's not too noticeable. A couple of final stages was the C branding on the shutter door. 
Thankfully, I did have the exact C stencil that comes from the Imperial Guard transportation transfer kit, and I cut it out, added some water to a little pan, soaked the transfer for a short period of time, and now the trick is do not, whatever you do, take that transfer off the paper until that little bit of paper backing is sitting on top of the surface or as close to it as possible of the thing that you want the transfer to sit on. Because if you pull that transfer off before it's sitting on a surface, it's gonna wrap right around whatever it is you're trying to move the transfer with rather than the surface you want it to sit on. I added this thing called Microsol Solution, which is a two-part process. The microsols added to the surface of the thing that you're trying to stick the transfer onto just to make sure the surface is good and ready to go for the transfer. And then once you've slid the transfer onto the surface, you then use part two to make the transfer a little bit more workable. And then you seal the whole thing with varnish. One issue with transfers is generally they're quite shiny. And even if you add a matte varnish, you can still have a little rim that you can see of the transfer outline. So the trick is to do something to the transfer to make it settle in with the model that surrounds it. In this instance, we're going to bring back some of that brown ink and some oils just to make sure that that C looks like it fits the environment rather than looking like a transfer that has been stuck on top of it. An additional step to make the C look like it was part of the shutter door was to add some metallic silver highlights back in over those said articulating shutter door joints. And I even made sure that I painted the highlights over the C of where those joints were, just to make it seem like it's sitting behind those highlights rather than on top. Finally, I added some small specks of brown oil paint over the shutter door and pulled them down with a stiff, wide dry brush to give the illusion that dirt and oil and grime was seeping down and slowly staining the entirety of the door. Now, the most important thing is to make sure some of those stains were going over the seat to really pull everything together. One final coat of matte varnish was added to seal all this together, and the models were finished. On to the presentation. There we are, the Adeptus Titanicus power generator range created by Forge World. I hope you enjoyed the episode as much as I did trying to figure out how to reverse engineer the paint scheme from just the cover art picture alone. If you're new here, please consider subscribing to the channel if this seems like your kind of thing. And if you've been here for a minute now, thank you so much for your ongoing support. Until next time, I'm Vincent signing off from here at Bunker 6.